recording of Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this regional meeting on out of school comprehensive sexuality education, ensuring rights, leaving no one behind. This meeting has the purpose of submitting the document on the international technical guidance on sexuality education prepared by UNFPA with other UN agencies. And its purpose is to put into context this guidance uh, within our Latin American region, providing visibility to its relevance when considering implementation in the different countries. Furthermore, we will be hearing experiences from countries that already have this kind of guidance in place, and we will be able to hear voices and opinions of some adolescents on these topics. The meeting includes the participation from the UNFPA regional office, uh, those responsible at the regional office who will present the document and put it into context in our region. And on the other hand, we have representatives from UNFPA Colombia and from the Ministry of Health of Paraguay that will talk about their experiences. And we will have representatives from Flax Argentina who will show a video to hear the voices of adolescents. As you know, we have simultaneous interpretation for this meeting, and we welcome participants from all countries in the region, that is Latin America and the Caribbean. To get started, we will give the floor to Florbella Fernandez, Deputy Director of the UNFPA Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much. My first words are those of thanks for having you all here today. It's an honor to be with you at this very important event to launch the uh, technical and programmatic guidance on out of school CSE. I would like to greet government counterparts, civil society organizations, youth networks, colleagues from UNFPA and the UN system. And I also thank uh, Karina Simino, Diego Rossi and all the Flexo Argentina team, our implementing partner in comprehensive sexuality education. And I also take this opportunity to welcome Ilya Sukov, who is the global focal point uh, for comprehensive sexuality education. So I wish you all a productive event. For over four decades, the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, has supported Latin American and Caribbean countries in developing CSE policy strategies and programs with the view to preparing adolescents and youth to make free and informed decisions on their sexuality and their reproductive lives. Since 2014, UNFPA and the country offices have been implementing a comprehensive sexuality education strategy so as to strengthen regional and national commitments and capabilities to ensure the right to a good quality, scientifically evidence-based and international standards-based CSE aligned with the visions of the Montevideo Consensus, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda to that call upon us not to leave anyone behind. 
CSE has made great progress as to its implementation in the formal educational system of many countries in the region. However, the situation is different and overall there's still a long way to go to achieve the goal of having this right guaranteed to all girls, boys and adolescents in the region. Today's world largest, one of the largest youth generations in history by investing in the health and education governments can contribute to the participation of youth in society, ensure their well-being and help them to achieve their maximum potential. Since it is at the intersection of education and health, comprehensive sexuality education is essential to achieve progress with regard to health and gender equality outcomes. It provides youth the tools they need to have healthy lives and relationships besides helping them to make transformative decisions regarding their sexual and reproductive health. Within this context and vis-a-vis -vis the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic with confinement and the closing of schools, it is most relevant to be able to present you these technical and programmatic guidance on CSE out of school. This guidance was drafted by UNFPA with the collaboration of WHO, UNESCO, UNAIDS and UNICEF. And it offers guidelines to prepare appropriate and safe CSE programs targeted to different groups of youth, particularly those who are not normally reached out to with this kind of program, that is youth out of school and highly vulnerable sectors of the population. Bearing in mind the challenge of leaving no one behind and serving the needs of the most vulnerable groups in each context, this guidance was prepared from a rights gender interculturality and inclusive perspective to be used with the disabled Afro-descendants, migrants, the indigenous, LGBTI, among others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florella for your introductory words. And now we are going to give the floor to Ilya Sukop. He's the global focal point on CSE at the Sexual and Reproductive Health Branch at UNFPA New York. He participated actively in the drafting of this guidance. So it will be great to have him tell us in his presentation which are the highlights of these international technical guidelines. Ilya, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Karina, and thank you so much, uh, Florbella, for these introductory remarks. And uh, you uh, mentioned very clearly most important things about this guidance, so my job will be much more easier to speak about it. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this very, very important meeting. And I remember that exactly this month, July, two years ago, I visited Panama and we had uh, this big uh, discussion at the regional level that time when the guidance was not finalized yet. And we discussed the main chapters, the main topics. Time flies so fast. 
So this year, two years after, we already have the finalized guidance and we have the Spanish translation of this guidance, which is great. And I hope that the guidance will be very uh, helpful to you in the region to implement comprehensive sexuality education out of school. So within next um, um, 20 or 15 minutes, I will... um, speak um, in a little bit more details about about the guidance itself, how it was developed, how it was written and why. But let me first start with UNFPA since UNFPA was the leading agency uh, to uh, write, to develop the guidance jointly with the partners. And I just would like to remind you that here in UNFPA, we have global strategy for adolescents and youth, my body, my life, my world. And this strategy puts young people um, and adolescents in the center of sustainable development. And um, uh, comprehensive sexuality education is the part of the pillar my life. So our approach in UNFPA, uh, that access to comprehensive sexuality education, supportive families and peers, safe schools and spaces for adolescents and the development of skills and other assets set adolescents and youth on a positive trajectory to adulthood. And we emphasize respect for adolescents' agency and autonomy, partnering with them rather than serving them as passive uh, beneficiaries. So uh, our approach that comprehensive sexuality education is not just something that we would like to put in the heads and the minds of young people. Uh, From our point of view, comprehensive sexuality education is the tool that will allow young people to make their own responsive choices uh, for their healthy life and well-being. Uh, It uh, took us quite a lot of time uh, to develop this guidance, guidance for out-of-school comprehensive sexuality education. Uh, You all know um, uh, UN International Technical Guidance on Sexuality Education, ITGSE, uh, which was um, uh, launched three years ago. But uh, work on the ITGSC was started in 2015 when UNESCO hosted all of us at the global consultation in Paris. And that time, at that consultation, when we discussed ITGSE, we received the clear and loud request, specifically from young people, that um, our stakeholders working in the area of CSE really need detailed guidance how to deliver comprehensive sexuality education out of schools. So since then, we started work on this guidance. First uh, year, the very uh, detailed literature review was conducted. Then uh, we spent a lot of months to do the round of in-depth interviews, uh, focus group discussions, uh, some kind of the uh, brainstorming meetings and conversations with experts, stakeholders, partners uh, from the government, and of course, with young people from most um, marginalized populations. And then based on all of this information, we wrote the guidance, uh, which affords more in-depth programmatic um, uh, tool on how to develop CEC programs that are appropriate and safe for different groups of children and young people. So this guidance, which you have in Spanish and which we have in English as well on the website of UNFPA and other UN agencies who are our collaborating partners, WHO, UNESCO, UNICEF, and UNAID, it's uh, the short version. We have the full version of the guidance, which is about 
200 pages, uh, which we're not finalized yet. And of course, it's only in English. But if you are working with UN agencies and you do these programs at national level, you can reach out to me or my team and headquarters, and we will be happy to share this draft version of the full guidance as well. So, um, as I said, uh, this new guidance uh, uh, define out-of-school comprehensive sexuality education. And we say that out-of-school CSC is a curriculum-based process and it could be delivered in different facilities. So please pay attention to these words that this is a curriculum-based process because despite we deliver CC out of school. It's not like random interventions. It should be a very structured process with written curriculum. And out of school CC follows the same objective that comprehensive sexuality education provided in schools. So our new out of school guidance is complementary to ITGSE. So this is two guide, these two guidance, these two publications go together, and these two publications together define our work in the area of comprehensive sexuality education. So going back to um, uh, out of school guidance, what is this guidance for? It is for anyone who design or implement comprehensive sexuality programs in out-of-school settings. It could be international and national civil society organizations. It could be community-based organizations, youth-led organizations, UN agencies, and of course, governments and institutions. Because yes, we are talking about community-based organization and youth-based organization that we can't develop and cannot deliver CSC programs without them. But at the same time, in terms of sustainability of CSC programs, of course, we rely on our partners from governments and institutions, and we rely on them to work with us and to lead this work at national level. Um, in the uh, introductory notes, Florella also mentioned um, about specific groups of young people which are included in this guidance. And now you can see them uh, on the slide uh, on your screens. Um, I should say that uh, one of the uh, um, one of the things which make me proud uh, um, on behalf of UNFPA and our partners in terms of this guidance that for the first time we provided um, guidance how to deliver CC for young people in humanitarian settings, for young indigenous people, uh, for intersex young people. So, um, of course, uh, uh, that never happened before. And that's why this is the uniqueness of this guidance. Um, how the guidance is structured. So uh, if you go through the guidance, you will see three main sections there. Section one provides an overview of out of school CC, including its definition, goals and roles, and the opportunities presented by out of school CSE. Section two presents guidance for developing and implementing out of school CSC in general, as well as for engaging peer educators, involving parents and guardians, and using technologies. And the section three provides guidance on delivering out of school CC to specific groups of young people. So for each of the group, we have um, separate um, um, chapter. Uh, which is focused on, uh, on, on this group. Um, uh, 
I just realized that unfortunately that's my bad. I uh, <laughs> I showed you the presentation which I prepared for the another region. Uh, I mistakenly <laughs> picked it up from the folder. It's not the right one for the lacro. So, but uh, to save the time, I will um, just um, speak without slides. So. Also, what I wanted to mention that despite we just uh, launched and present this guidance today, but we started to test this guidance two years ago in uh, four regions in the world and uh, Latin America and Caribbean is one of the regions uh, we, uh, which works with us to test the guidance. And one of the country, Colombia, is included in this uh, piloting or testing of um, this guidance. And the main idea of this, uh, of this testing to get evidence-based scientific data at the end of the phase two of this project, which will show us which approaches from this guidance are most effective and which approaches from this guidance require uh, from us uh, some additional work or some additional thinking. And this data will help us to promote this guidance in other countries and in other regions as well. And, you know, uh, 2020 and 2021, uh show to us that this guidance is so in time especially in the time of the pandemic when uh, adolescents didn't have access to school so they used a lot um digital um apps for education including comprehensive sexuality education and this guidance again provides some tips how to use these digital technologies uh, to deliver uh, um, CC out of school. So uh, to make the long story short, it's like basic information about the guidance. You can find it, uh, more information if you go, if you read it. But the most interesting to hear practical uh, examples and practical tips from people who already work in the field with this guidance. So Karina, I uh, will give floor to you to go through our agenda and to hear from our colleagues, how do they deliver sexuality education out of school based on this guidance? Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you for this presentation and for this document. Now we'll turn the floor to Virginia Camacho, who is the Regional Technical Advisor in Sexual and Reproductive Health Regional Office of Latin America and the Caribbean. She will give us the way how the document that Ilya presented and how the region that already is uh, carrying out some experience with the implementation uh, is how are they doing with this? You have the floor, Virginia. Your microphone is muted. Thank you, Karina. Thank you for the introduction and Ilia for sharing with us the highlight of the technical guidance on out-of-school CSE. And uh, the introduction to this, I'm the responsible for uh, CFE and I'm responsible particularly for CSE. As Karina said, I will present a brief overview of what we are emphasizing in the implementation of the out-of-school 
CIC strategy together with comprehensive uh, sexuality education within the school. The idea is that these will be the topics we will be addressing. So, in terms of the implementation of these with guidance and the efforts of the organizations to provide countries, civil societies, youth and families the best available tools to implement out-of-school CSC. Now, why out-of-school CSE in our region, and why is it such an important line of work for UNFPA? Let's begin with some relevant data. We should note that this is a region, both Latin America and the Caribbean, where the inequity gap is significant, and it's also one of the most unequal regions of the world. And the population of adolescents and youth includes over 140 million people, and poverty affects almost one third of them. One third of youth between 15 and 29 years of age do not attend any school. And it's important to note that indigenous uh, women and youth and Afro-descendant women and youth from rural areas show a lower school attendance and completion compared to their peers in urban areas and from other ethnic or racial origin. You know that the pregnancy rate, uh, teenage pregnancy rate is one of the highest in our region. And we think this is the result of inequality and the equality gap because teenagers have forced pregnancy or early marriages. They get pregnant under the age of 19 and those that live in rural areas. In this case, the, the situation is much worse than those that live in urban areas and have access to school and medical care. We know, and this is recent data of the national system, that we know that most of the countries in our region have birth rates in for children under the age and five births for every 1,000 girls between the ages of 10 and 14. A pregnancy of children under 14 is a result of situations of sexual abuse. And this calls us to action because often this is a result of sexual abuse and uh, this is considered a forced pregnancy. A few data from our region from the last uh, five years. There's a significant uh, percentage that reported that the first sexual intercourse had been unwanted or resulted from rape. As in Jamaica, for instance, 50% said it was wanted, but almost the same amount said it had been unwanted or forced resulting from rape. And on the other hand, another study carried out by Pajo shows the differences between the countries based on demography and health. Some women 
An adolescent showed that in the case of Haiti, 21% had reported that the first sexual intercourse had been forced or a result of sexual violence. This illustrates the situation experienced by girls in our region. By ethnic and racial condition, we looked at data for 11 countries in 2010, the coffee color are Afro-descendant adolescents, orange and non-Afro-descendants, and in yellow, the differences there are in the proportion of girls aged 15 to 19 who are mothers, whether they are Afro-descendants or non-Afro-descendants. Here you can see the gaps in the countries between adolescent pregnancies in Afro-descendant and non-Afro-descendant girls. And in the case of adolescent indigenous women, and based on the last censuses of the countries, being indigenous and living in the rural countries, in, in the rural area in some countries, leads to a higher proportion of adolescent pregnancy than being non-indigenous and living in a rural environment. We see that it can be three times more in, among indigenous girls living in rural areas. These are data illustrating these big inequalities and equality gaps in our country that is leading youth uh, and adolescents to live or experience very special circumstances because now we are ex experiencing a COVID pandemic that has an effect on adolescent pregnancy. We, through the health services, have verified that one of the great difficulties and barriers to access uh, sexual and reproductive health services uh, has mainly been among adolescents. And these difficulties and barriers in access, not only to contraceptive methods, but also to other reproductive and sexual health services, that is information, guidance, all this could have an effect on the increase in the adolescent pregnancy rates. On the other hand, the confinement measures that we have all experienced during these 16 months of the pandemic and also adolescents have exacerbated sexual violence and abuse within families. And in some countries, and another important factor is that schools are still closed. So adolescents are not receiving co comprehensive sexuality education because in virtual education, they, they've had to prioritize the subjects taught. So making efforts concerning out of school CSE has become an important priority in current times. So in brief, the adolescent pregnancy rate estimated for last year was 60.7%, the second highest in the world. The risk of mat mat maternal mortality is double that among under 15 year olds compared to women over that age in uh, middle and low income countries. And at least one out of each three women, youth or girls have been victims of some sort of physical violence. They've been abused or forced to have sexual intercourse against their consent by an acquaintance or a family member. So estimates at the end of 2016 pointed out 
at around 77,000 adolescents between the ages of 10 and 19 were living with HIV in the region. And in absolute terms, 9 million women between the ages of 15 and 19 require contraceptives and only 62% are using modern contraceptive methods. And over a million girls and adolescents are victims of sexual violence or other forms sexual acts in Latin America and the Caribbean. So what happens with the second element? And that is what's happening with the implementation of uh, CSE in the educational systems of the region. Last year, we established a state of the art with UNFPA offices across the region, asking about where the implementation of CSE stood in the region. And I can share two essential facts here. Firstly, the implementation of comprehensive sexuality education in the region is heterogeneous. It's generally low or the level of coverage is unknown. And a second element is that 67% of the countries asserts that their degree of coverage at schools is either low or unknown. So this is information that must lead us to reflect on the matter and to continue strengthening CS. E strategies, recognizing that CSE is a central element to contribute to sustainable development goals, contribute to the targets that we've set forth within the Montevideo Consensus, Cairo Plus 25, and con to contribute to reverse adverse effects in our region, such as unintended adolescent pregnancy. Furthermore, the pandemic uh, has highly affected the implementation of CSE in all countries in the region. 78% of the countries said that it had affected the implementation of CSE in all countries. Now, what are we doing to implement out-of-school comprehensive sexuality education in Latin America and the Caribbean? On the one hand, we have developed a platform in support of the countries in the step-by-step -step systematic implementation, addressing four aspects that we believe are very important. On the one hand, ensure the intersectionalities that exist that Ilya put it on the table when he made this presentation of the guidance. Then the importance of intersectoriality. On the other hand, we must recognize that there is complementariness between CSE inside and outside schools. And another element that's very important is the territorial nature for implementing these initiatives. And in this step-by-step, -step, in this systemic or systematic addressing of the topics that we are proposing. We started with a situation diagnostic study of each country called a quick diagnostic study. We have established the baseline and identified a specific territory to implement the strategy and identify the target population. Then we selected institutions and stakeholders that will implement um, the strategy pursuant to the diagnostic study. Then the formulation of a specific strategy for each context and then setting up an interdisciplinary intersectoral team to lead the strategy and strengthen and the capacities of governments and civil society to implement the strategy. These are core elements in the approach that we are promoting at UNFPA in partnership with Flaxo Argentina, that's our implementing partner in 
in school and out of school comprehensive sexuality education. Likewise, it's important to design a curriculum in CSE for the selected target population, then select and train facilitators that will implement these activities of CSE out of school, then implement CSE out of school uh, with adolescents and or families in coordination with social and health services. And here we refer to multi-component interventions. This is co a core matter when we want to reduce gender-based violence, reduce adolescent pregnancies, uh, HIV, sexually transmitted diseases, so and develop or build capacities so that youth and adolescents can live a healthy life. Then we have the systematization and evaluation of the experience, which is another very important line, and also scaling up. We start at a, a small level and then scale it up and then building knowledge and building evidence something that Ilya mentioned the importance of generating evidence when we talk about implementing comprehensive sexuality education in and out of school so progress we've made to date at UNFPA, the regional office together with the country offices and FLAG so well. We've developed uh, online training courses of, on CSE out of school, particularly for the technical teams in the countries and at UNFPA. We are also uh, rendering technical assistance to the countries through demonstrative experiences in Colombia. Ilya already mentioned this. Colombia is part of the global pilot project to document the implementation of CSE out of schools. And today, we will be lucky to share with Johanna some of the progress made through this experience in Colombia. We are also working in Paraguay, Panama, Nicaragua, and now we're going to start working in Costa Rica. These are the countries in which we are, or to which we are rendering technical assistance and also documenting their experiences in our regional and catalyzer role. We are interested in being able to systematize these experiences and carry out evaluation so as to scale up the initiatives at country levels and supporting the countries is another issue. We know that out of school CSE initiative have existed for decades in the region vis-a-vis -vis the lack of formal programs. We've always had uh, initiatives in education at the territorial level, including CSE. This effort is being made to support the countries in their efforts to systematize their experiences and generate evidence to share within the countries and also with other countries in the region and at the global level. And then we've produced a series of teaching material to facilitate the implementation of these initiatives. And as you can see, these are the courses for CSE, uh, uh, out of school that we've prepared with Flaxo Argentina in 2019 and 2020. We delivered courses one and two for the technical staff at UNFPA. And now we are launching the course for the technical teams in the different countries on comprehensive sexuality education called in Guaranteeing or Ensuring Rights, Leaving No One Behind. And the purpose of this course is not only to increase knowledge, but also the capabilities of the technical teams in the countries to design and implement comprehensive sexuality education strategies out of school. And they're based on these uh, 
technical and programmatic guidance on out of school comprehensive sexuality education that was just presented by Ilia from the UNFPA and also on the best evidence available. Also, during the COVID pandemic, we developed a number of resources that support the initiative of out of school CSE. It's called Pausa. We go again. We stop, we go again. Pausa, vamos de nuevo. This is an effort made with Flaxo, and we provide, as part of this package, tools for adolescents, for parents, and for guardians, as well as for teachers. For this, we have a number of resources, like videos, that are focused on uh, adolescents between 13 and 18 years of age. And they focus on three other, we think, very important. Prevention of STDs, amongst others, prevention of teenage pregnancy, an approach to relations in social media, and prevention of sexual violence. We post images on social networks, the host mute me. And on the other hand, we also have specific guidelines for educators. This you can find on the web page of Flaxo Argentina. And lastly, we have videos and other materials we developed for the families that wish to educate their family. It's called Spaces to Listen Attentive Without Judging and uh, Information to Offer Youth. And to conclude, there are a number of opportunities and challenge for out-of-school CSE in our region. Amongst these that we identified, we have conceptual and methodological reference framework to address out-of-school CSE with international standards uh, for CSE plus uh, GUT. CSE guidelines out of school. We have important concepts for the policies and the program approaches. They're focused on integrality, intersectoriality, intersectionality, rights, and gender equality. So we have all this available. On the other hand, we have multiple data multiple initiatives that we've had for quite some time on CSE out of school in Latin America and the Caribbean, but this guideline opens the opportunity to review our approaches, priorities, and reorient the experiences according to the CSE quality criteria. They need, there is a need for a political will from government, civil society, and specific populations at a national and regional and territorial region. And today there's a better understanding of the added value and complementary value of CSC taught out of the school. Regarding challenges, from our viewpoints, the challenges include a better understanding of CSE as a public policy that should have an intersectoral approach. We still see insufficient intersectoral and interprogrammatic coordination. We don't have all the human and financial resources we would like to ensure a quality implementation targeting specific populations left behind, such as those that live in rural areas, indigenous communities, the LGBTQ community, people living in extreme poverty in our countries, Afro-descendant populations, any population that 
has uh, or is in socially vulnerable situation. There's little uh, assessment and monitoring of the implementation, and it's also still a challenge for us to have a shared vision and clear goals about CSE and its contributions. We know the benefits of CSE. We know that there are clear goals, but we still need a shared vision. And then another challenge is prioritizing and the scale up of out of school CSC programs. This is what we wanted to share with you. And I hope you will have this material available when you need it. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you very much for your presentations. You've given us a good overview of why to address this issue is important in our region. The data speak louder than all what we can say. It was very well founded. Why do we need to work on this and why these uh, this guidance is so important? It's also interesting to see the model you shared about how we're doing it, which is a model that is under construction. We're still building it amongst all of us that's been work of us that have been working on this matter in the region, systematizing the best way to implement CSE in the region. So thank you very much. Now we'll turn the floor to Diego Rossi from the Social Sciences and Health Program, Flaxo Argentina, colleague with whom we've been working on this issue of uh, CSE. And he will bring the voices of adolescents to us because we here can see why adolescents think it's important that we address this out of school in their country. Thank you very much, Karina. As we said, we want to bring the voices of adolescents and youth from our region, trying to understand, comprehend, and listen to what they suggest or think why we need comprehensive sexuality education out of school. Of course, it's not the official voice of these countries. It's a voice of adolescents and youth of eight countries from our region that speak and tell what they believe or what they understand is out of school CSE. So I'm going to share my screen for you to see the video that we have. Adolescents and teenagers need CSE out of school because in the schools, the schools don't guarantee access to uh, sexual information and teachers teach using a prejudice. Somebody saying that they can't see the video. I'm sorry, would you like to rewind and start again? I see it. We see it clearly. ¿Quieres agrandarlo, Diego? Bueno. Sometimes they teach with a religious view. We need this horizontal approach and we need to be part of the learning. CESE is useful because if we have clear and timely information, we can make good decisions to live our sexuality in a responsible manner. CES out of school is important because it's a topic that unfortunately not much is said in Nicaragua, in the schools, and therefore youth is not ready to address this issue. That's why we must 
strengthen it out of school so youth, particularly adolescents that are growing and starting to have questions and experiences with this are prepared. First, because it's a critical analysis of the education as a subject. It also allows us to give a comprehensive view with a human rights approach, creating healthy spaces where we can have access and exercise sexual and reproductive health. Thirdly, it meets the emerging needs of this group, creates support networks with the different instances. It helps us to do away with taboos, myths, stereotypes, social labels imposed by society. It also does away with gender-based violence and social inequalities. On the other hand, it allows us to live freely with autonomy on our bodies and our decisions. It also allows us to live healthy relations and above all, achieve our life project. The youth in Argentina have been struggling for many years for a real implementation of CEE in the schools. However, we think that it shouldn't be only in schools. We can also bring CSE to our homes, to our work, to the streets, so we can have an intersectorial and cross-cutting perspective of our life. That's why we believe that CSE gives us the possibility to ask ourselves, know ourselves, and know others better. CSE helps to reduce among teenagers and adolescents unhealthy practices because we see sexuality as a taboo. This only leads to increased STDs, a number of teenage pregnancies, whereas the better prepared our adolescents and youth are trained in sexual reproductive health, and the sooner they are, better will they be able to analyze uh, this issue, and we will have a young generation that's much healthier. The importance of out-of-school CSE in adolescents and youth is that it enables us to have the skills to prevent risk sexual behavior, which is reflected in early pregnancies, next pregnancies, undesired pregnancies, also the risk of STD transmission and the gender-based violence by homophobia, by phobias, and all those types of violence that l are based on discrimination because of sexual orientation. What is CSE useful for? CSE transform changes you, but it also allows us to build a more just society, a society with sexual and reproductive rights are a real component to construct peace. Adolescents and youth with disabilities need CSE not only to learn and look after our sexual and reproductive health, but also to exercise the right to full enjoyment of our sexuality. CSC allows us to know our sexual and reproductive rights and also find the necessary support to exercise them. CSC out of school benefit girls, boys and youth complementing the education they get in school on sexuality in the different needs and specific groups of girls, boys and youth. CSC out of school enables them to have a formal and flexible space, which wouldn't be paid possible in the schools. Okay, we have heard the voices of these youths and adolescents that belong to organizations that work on sexual and reproductive rights, but that also take on the claim for having comprehensive sexuality education with all these traits they were mentioning. So 
now we leave behind the voices of adolescence and go on to hear how CSE out of school is developing in some countries in our region. Thank you very much, Karina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Diego, for bringing the voices of the leading players here. And now we will refer to country experiences, and we're going to start with Colombia's experience to be presented by Johanna Blanco from UNFPA Colombia. Johanna, you have the floor. So you can share your presentation too. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for allowing me to share what we've learned in Colombia through this great global project that Ilya and Vicky already mentioned in their presentations. This uh, project in Colombia was called Tira la Plena. Well, and Tira la Plena in Colombia has to do with where we developed the project in Colombia. It's a jargon for talk to me without lies candidly. What we want to share with you are the findings, the outcomes and lessons learned from seven other experiences that we were able to systematize support. Uh, these are experiences that have been in place in the country for quite some time, and it's good to learn from them and to know that we are reaching out to the populations of interest, as mentioned in Ilya's uh, presentation, through out-of-school CSE. We are going to share the steps for design and implementation. Tira La Plena was focused on 10 to 17-year-olds in a situation of humanitarian crisis, particularly uh, Venezuelan migrants and their host community. And the other experiences we supported were focused on girls and boys in and youth in that had been detained, indigenous youth, uh, focusing on girls and women and those living in rural areas. And then an interesting experience with the victims of the armed conflict. Be since these are victims of the conflict, we carried out special work with them. We also carried out an work with Universidad del Norte, where we were able to hear about the social norms on sexual and reproductive uh, rights of girls, boys and adolescents, their families, institutional and community players, where we were going to implement our project Tira La Plena. We mapped services and programs that were being developed in these municipalities regarding sexual and reproductive health and rights with the support of WHO and in a very participatory manner, we reached a three-level intervention model, an individual intervention model with girls, boys, and adolescents at the family level and then at the institutional and community level. And this was reflected uh, throughout uh, the implementation and support process. The Colombian Institute for Family Wellbeing is one of our partners uh, that's in charge of uh, the well-being of girls, boys, adolescents, and their families. And it's a second state organization with greater presence across the national territory. This organization, ICBF, hired this another organization, Development of Life, Desarrollo y Vida, in charge of executing Tira la Plena. And then we had civil society organizations involved and uh, the support of international cooperation from UNICEF in one of our experiences. The specific objective of this project is to contribute to preventing uh, pregnancy among children and adolescents, uh, preventing gender-based violence, sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV, through uh, knowledge, attitudes, uh, 
and social norms and skills and validated in the individual family and community dynamics that have a negative effect on the enjoyment of sexual and reproductive rights. The participants, as I said, were girls, boys and adolescents from 10 to 17, and we selected six municipalities from the Atlantic Department on, in the north of Colombia and the Caribbean coast. We selected them because they had um, very high fertility rates among children and adolescents compared to the national average, an increase in uh, gender-based violence, more people living with HIV and with a high presence of migrants, particularly from Venezuela. Among the actions developed and still ongoing, we will be ending the project in December this year. During the initial stage, which we consolidated the partnership with ICBF, which was a great lesson learned to, with an, the possibility of having an incidence or advocating for public policies, reaching out to all municipalities in the country, developing and carrying out uh, research for training purposes and in parallel work on drafting the curriculum where we had feedback from the research we were carrying out so to, as to adjust the curriculum to the age and context of the participants. Uh, when in the preparedness phase, we uh, prioritize and convene the population and based on a given profile of facilitators and their training through a virtual course, uh, we then selected them, but uh, we had to because of COVID provides uh, online support. This year we started with in-person training and we're gonna compare these two modalities too. And then we manage spaces for in-person processes with the participants. As to implementation that lasted three months after uh, many months of, of pandemic at the end of September last year, we were able to hold 22 sessions with the participants, girls, boys and adolescents, 11 were in person, 11 were online, three family meetings, three community meetings, and two uh, teaching outreach meetings extended to the neighborhood and the community. And this is the main point we are aiming at, which are the main uh, lessons learned and the findings, not only from the project Tirada Plena, but also from the seven experiences we were able to systematize. And you can find information on our website. And we've divided these lessons learned in three into three stages, preparedness, uh, planning and implementation. Under preparedness, a great lesson learned was the importance of having a shared vision on childhood and adolescence. This is something that must be talked over within the organizations, not for profits that are implementing out of school CSE. This is a determining factor to see how you can approach girls, boys and adolescents also. Uh, building identity elements. Um, that is one of the comments we received in our project, how easy it was to relate to the logo and to the Tira La Plena project itself. I mean, it, we may have uh, copy books, backpacks, uh, uh, elements that give us that sense of it belonging to a group. This gives a lot of strength to the project. Then the profile of the facilitators and their training. We have a profile in which we have defined the experience, the training, the knowledge, the attitudes that these facilitators must have that provide C out of school CSE um, ver define very well a process for training and reinforcing these competencies. That, as I said, we've done this online and now, thanks to the vaccine, uh, we've been able to do it in person now, but it's essential to have a training space and also support this as project moves along. Then planning the curriculum is fundamental or designing the curriculum is fundamental. 
we have uh, mapped 34 experiences, but only 10 or 11 have a written cu curriculum. And this is reflected in the strength, the structure, the effects of the intervention. So this curriculum must have very clear learning objectives, didactic sequences, and uh, medium and long uh, term scope and not only in the short run and under preparedness among those people that are going to implement the initiative uh, monitoring and follow-up uh, agreements that are very clear must be reached this we learn through systematization when people don't know how the processes and actions and activities are going to be measured we can generate lots of noise so we must know where we are heading for to know uh, know what the indicators are the expected outcomes all this must be clear from the very beginning so we are all in sync regarding planning we have three lessons learned very specific ones uh, that is the context itself it must go beyond figures or data that we may look into in the statistics institute this must be go go this must go beyond that it must be a very broad scope uh, carrying out quick diagnosis has allowed us to have the view of what's happening in each territory at the individual family and community level as to knowledge attitude social norms but also we must know the risks that we will face when implementing this uh, know what the policies are whether there are programs that may come into this CSE initiatives, who are the key stakeholders at community and institutional level that can uh, uh, join or be a challenge for the project. And then managing space is also essential. We had all sorts of uh, spaces, uh, uh, football field, for instance. This is the great challenge of CSE out of school. We don't have a classroom as such, so we can look for different spaces that must have conditions allowing us to provide confidentiality, privacy, ventilation, biosecurity nowadays too, and being able to move around, be uh, at a distance from one another, not, feel, not be uncomfortable. So we've included uh, interesting information from the different experiences. This is uh, part of the logistics, but it's key for teaching due to COVID-19 that adaptation and flexibility capacity in the curriculum, the time frame, the materials, we had to call upon those capabilities and in planning, it's important to bear this in mind. As to implementation and with this I end, we always must recognize the body, the, the physical aspect. Now with biosecurity, we must think very well about all the teaching actions to protect ourselves, but body in CSE must be a core essential element to bear in mind in teaching and also evaluation of emotions, recognition of experiences of the participants. And we heard very interesting experiences where participation rituals uh, give a very profound meaning to this and uh, foster that sense of belonging and empowerment of the participants, which we hope to share with you at some time. Then involvement of the families is a key factor. The guidance says this, and we were able to prove it through the systematization of experiences and the challenges uh, or one of the challenges is how to do this and what role the families play in the initiatives. But the big conclusion is that the families require, need comprehensive sexuality education. They're asking for that. Sometimes they say that the families are against this CSC initiative, but when we go out to the territories and we open their doors, the families are very thankful. They're really willing to learn and to strengthen their capabilities in support of their children. And 
due to COVID, we learned the use of technological tools, something that is very interesting to see how we can adjust and look at different possibilities through WhatsApp, TikTok, Facebook, to interact despite the distance there is at this time. As I said, you can go to www.eiscolumbia.org slash descubreme. Uh, there you can see all our experiences and we invite you to follow us on the social media uh, where we're also disseminating and the lessons learned and deepening our experience so as to continue building knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johanna, for sharing the experience of Colombia. Really interesting. And uh, high output. There's a lot to learn from what you're doing in Colombia. And now we'll see the presentation from Paraguay by Dr. Patricia Beluva, who's the Director General of the Health Programs at the Ministry of Public Health and Social Welfare of Paraguay. Patricia, you have the floor. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen with you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to greet you and share this experience with you, this experience we did in Paraguay, and tell you how we implemented out-of-school CSE, upholding the rights, leaving no one behind. In Paraguay, we call it education for the comprehensive welfare of girls, boys, and teenagers, or adolescents and their family. This methodology is within the framework of adolescent uh, pregnancy prevention project and prevention of sexual abuse. Applying a comprehensive approach is developed jointly by four ministries, the Ministry of Public Health and Social Welfare, the Ministry of uh, minors and Adolescent Ministry of Education and Science, the Ministry of Labor, Employment and Social Security, with the support of UNFPA Paraguay and the Regional Office of UNFPA for Latin America and the Caribbean. DOR has financing from the Government of India and UNFPA. In 2016, in Paraguay, we presented the Regional Strategic Framework to reduce uh, teenage pregnancy. And since that year, we've been working in coordination to reduce the number of pregnancies in adolescents and girls between the ages of 10 to 19. Paraguay has one of the highest uh, pregnancy rates in the southern cone. And currently, we don't have a national strategy to avoid to provide CSE. In our countries, the anti-rights groups have become very strong and have a lot of clout, and they oppose and hinder and even prevent progress on this issue with strategies that are very well developed. So the four ministries mentioned recognize that the evidence is clear to prevent what we need to do is educate. So we decided to work first with the families and then in partnerships with girls, boys, and adolescents. We selected a district, the district of Kawasu, that's in the central part of the country. It's the eighth district with the highest number of teenage pregnancy and the fourth with the highest number of sexual abuse cases. As a strength, we find the presence of all these 
uh, institutions in the territory. So we saw that we could really start this process of CSE. We also found that in this district, there is a highly representative population that includes rural families, urban families, indigenous peoples, people that speak Guarani and that could be a good representation of the entire Paraguayan population. This Flax Argentina, we hired a consultant and this includes representatives with the four ministries, representatives UNFPA and the regional office for Latin America and the Caribbean of UNFPA. Among the main goals, we have reducing pregnancy in girls and adolescents, adolescents under the age of 19 with emphasis on prevention and uh, addressing uh, violence and sexual abuse. We hope to achieve very good results. Uh, the outcome, girls, adolescents, their families and communities be informed about their sexual and reproductive rights, as well as prevention of sexual abuse and the importance of reducing unintended pregnancy in adolescents. Similarly, with the family and the communities, we want the link with the state be good so they can really contribute to this strategy. Address families and adolescents between the ages of 10 and 19. And we will provide training to tutors, guardians, and parents regarding the role of the family in teaching these matters. Among the activities we carried out, and as it refers to the course, we address the political commitment at a very high level. The executive board of the project includes ministers and representatives, as well as a UNFPA representative. We addressed the socialization of international evidence or CSE as well the state of the art of adolescent uh, pregnancy and sexual abuse. And we analyzed the country's legal framework and the feasibility of the project in order to move forward with it. The inst uh, institutional technical team included the intersectoral group at the central and local level, and we developed proposals based on terms of reference, uh, hiring of consultants. As we saw, each ministry needed so that we could identify all what interfered with the, all the problems that arose with the implementation of the program. We worked in the district of Kawasu and we developed the methodology that we needed to implement. Each module will have a duration of two weeks and will include one or two conferences and four, including different activities, uh, mandatory readings and written work. The modules are written in a very simple language very plain so that they can use it with the young people and the families in the area. There will also, it will also include 
the literature and teaching materials to facilitate the implementation of the strategy. In each module, we will also include exercises and uh, record national and local experiences to relate to the matter. And some of them will be addressed in other fora. At all moments, we will promote the establishment of uh, links to the knowledge and the practices of each one of the participants, which will be part of the inputs for the work that each module will include. The design of the platform was to allow the full participation of the attendants as well as favor interpersonal communication and with the group of trainers. Really, we hope to start the process in August. We have to upload the course to the platform of the Ministry of Public Health and Social Welfare, and we need to work with the facilitators and then after training them, we'll begin with actions with the family. We've been working with this process in the community with the different stakeholders of the different ministries, and we've carried out different activities, which are a preamble to the launching of this out of school CSE strategy. So we see in Paraguay, the commitment that comes from the uh, highest political level, and that is fundamental. It's also necessary to have an intersectoral technical team to facilitate the development of intersectoral strategies and move forward. And of importance is that this be sustained over time because we want all the local stakeholders in the area of Kawasu be empowered. So when the project ends or the financing from the government of India, this be established in the community and uh, can be taken to other districts. We want to have a common discourse framework based on uh, scientific evidence because this facilitates the establishment of partnerships and reduces the negative impact of the anti-right groups that are fighting the implementation of out-of-school CSE in Paraguay. The pandemic was a barrier, but the colleague from Colombia also mentioned that it was an opportunity to innovate, to reinvent ourselves or achieve better strategies for communication. And amongst all the difficulties, we saw a good source or a good instrument to reach out to adolescents and their families with uh, these digital platforms. For us, developing the strategy and this methodology in partnership with four ministries facilitates the possibility of moving forward with public policies that have that are enriched with uh, intersectorial and interdisciplinary uh, view and also enables that the processes remain that have a good uh, support at a national level. This is all my presentation, and we in Paraguay hope to move forward as soon as possible with this, because the pandemic revealed a lot of difficulties and problems that adolescents face in the type of uh, sexual abuse and intrafamily violence. Thank you very much.
Thank you for sharing the Paraguayan experience, Patricia. It's very interesting to see how you've worked on an intersectoral basis with the ministries so that the implementation of out of school CSE becomes a public policy and how you have overcome the barriers in the country with the different groups. So uh, both experiences have been very enriching, showing us how within each context implementation adapts and must adapt to the specificities. And now for the closing, we will give the floor to Dr. Virginia Camacho. Thank you very much, Karina. Colleagues who have participated in today's meeting, I think it's been a very enriching conversation because based on a guidance document on how to implement uh, out-of-school comprehensive sexuality education, we have been able to go from conceptual frameworks and core elements of the guide to aspects uh, that relate to meeting the needs of the adolescents that you have presented today, not only needs as to comprehensive sexuality education, but also the different approaches and the lines of work considered a priority in this area through to the richness in the implementation processes at country level. We have been able to see this very significant line of learning. What does it mean to make available at the territorial level where the populations with the greatest needs are, these tools and instruments and all the steps to be followed so that we reach out to the people for whom the initiatives have been designed. There's also another element I would like to highlight here, which is this convergence that we have viewed today, convergence uh, at the normative and policy level with uh, those groups facing the greatest needs. We have a, a macro policy view, but on the other hand, at the local level, we have clearly established the needs and had joint work done there that translates into intersectionality and intersectoriality in a specific area. Thirdly, the development of the tools according to each context. I think today we've been able to clearly identify that if we use a systematic approach to be able to implement uh, out of school CSE, there's an essential requirement here, and that is to have clear conceptual approaches, but also be able to clearly identify the steps that are needed to indeed meet the needs of these groups that need comprehensive sexuality education. On the other hand, I'd finally like to say that there is an aspect which is not a minor one, which is the importance of support, technical support, 
pol policies level support for these initiatives. This is crucial. It's essential to have these groups to conduct the process at territorial level with the participation of all strategic stakeholders to ensure success or also to be able to address some of the challenges that come up in our work. And to conclude, I'd like to say that uh, at the UNFPA Regional Office for Latin America and the Caribbean and at Flaxo Argentina, we have a team working on comprehensive sexuality education. We have a network and we are willing to support uh, any of the country's initiatives in this field, supporting them from the conceptual and methodological standpoint, but also providing lessons learned in implementation. I think that in this way, we can meet the needs of this area. As you saw in UNFPA's presentation, this is an area that calls for greater strengthening at country level, either through formal education and out of school comprehensive sexuality education, bearing in mind all the recommendations and evidence that the guidance and the technical and programmatic uh, guidelines provide us that are evidence and experience based. So once again, I'd like to thank the Flexo Argentina team, our panelists, Ilya, our colleague, uh, who's the global focal point at headquarters, who is actively working with us and with the countries to reinforce comprehensive sexuality education in our region. Thank you very much, Bella, for having shared your remarks with us today. And our colleagues from the different countries, civil society representatives, youth, adolescents, and other interested in this topic. So from UNFPA and Flaxo, we are open to collaborate in any initiatives the countries may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you all for participating. And uh, we thus finalize this meeting that will be posted on the uh, Flaxo webpage. Those that have not been able to attend today can watch it later. Thank you all.